We're going to finish up today with uh, our discussion of foreclosure. We're going to pull together some of the strands that we've set in play in the first two of these mini lectures. And we're going to ask the question, hopefully give a little bit of an answer to it by the time we conclude. You've been talking, Derek, a lot about foreclosure, but what is foreclosed? It seems to be a question. So before we return back to Stan Van Hurler's helpful, in fact, invaluable resource, uh, his book, The Subject of Psychosis, I did want to give you that footnote that I mentioned last time, but then couldn't find quickly enough. It comes towards the end. This is the footnote describing the relationship of repression and negation. It's a footnote that comes right at the end of uh, this uh, book, but uh, more appropriately, more directly, right at the end of the Wolfman case and Freud notes, he says, negation is only introduced by the process of repression. So just to, to keep, give you that important point. Right, let's return now to the topic of foreclosure. And having described and done some kind of theoretical work and locating the key coordinates within Freud and seeing how uh, Lacan takes up the idea, we could ask, what are the effects of foreclosure? It's a very important question. And as I was starting to think about those uh, effects, two examples came to mind, both, both cinematic examples. The first is the case of John Nash Jr., the uh, Nobel winning uh, mathematician. Uh, the film about his life was titled after the book, uh, uh, best-selling biography called A Beautiful Mind. And many people will be familiar with the film. We have in uh, A Beautiful Mind, the case of a psychotic person who manages a, a good degree of stabilization for a long part of his life. Um, experiences a series of successes as, as a mathematician, but then eventually there is some psychotic break and he spends 25 plus years in, you could say, uh, periodic bursts of exacerbated forms of schizophrenia. So here's one reference point. And as we move on in these lectures to talk more about the name of the father on psychosis more directly, I'll also refer back to, to some of that. So just to keep that, that one uh, case study, that figure, the biography of John Nash in mind, we can use it in illustrative capacity. We could ask, now that I've introduced it as such, where would we see foreclosure in, in, in the case of Nash's life? How, how would we feel the impacts? What would be the consequences of foreclosure in Nash's life? And then the second example I wanted to bring to mind was uh, of another film, um, Into the Wild? This is uh, the uh, Sean Penn film. I think it's around 2006. It's the uh, film about the life of Christopher McCandless, who's this uh, young, very talented, uh, I think he was a graduate of Emory University and he was kind of adventurer. And uh, I'm not necessarily saying that Christopher McCandless should be seen as in any way psychotic, but there is a scene in the film, also based on a book that I think stays with a lot of people and it just seemed evocative in terms of the general discussion of foreclosure that we've entered into. That at a certain point in the film, he cuts ties with his family, with his parents, even with his sister, whom they have, you know, seemingly, at least from her standpoint, a very good relationship. He cuts ties with them, he drives his car. After graduating from Emory, he drives way out west, leaves his car, burns the money he has, burns his um, social security card and walks into the wild. Funnily enough, uh, when I saw the film, I thought, wow, this is great, but that's a little exaggerated, that detail. This is, of course, said by someone for whom, who's neurotic for the you know, the very idea of anything approaching a kind of uh, foreclosure-like gesture. It's unthinkable, of course, but it seemed to me exaggerated. But then going and looking at um, John Krakauer's book, who wrote, you know, the, the, who gathered the evidence and wrote a book of that same title, apparently that did happen. So why do I give those two examples? Well, I I'm, I'm want to use both of them in an illustrative capacity to think a little bit about the effects of foreclosure. Or we could say, if I am a subject whose life and psychical apparatus and psychical defenses is not organized and structurally uh, defined by repression, but by another form of, could we say, defense, 
if I am a, a, a subject to foreclosure, what will the challenges be in my life and how will that be differentiated from neurosis, the life of neurotic subjects? So what I want to do quickly is, is just read, uh, I'm going to do a kind of paraphrase of a series of important points that I think Stan Van Hurler makes. We'll speak about them, we'll link them back to, the, to those uh, two little anecdotes that I've given you, uh, the cinematic anecdotes that I've given you, and then we'll conclude. So, <clears throat> discussing consequences of foreclosure. One of the most interesting ways of approaching the topic is that uh, when we think about foreclosure, it's a term that Lacan has spent some time thinking about. He likes it because it, he wants to use it in a kind of linguistic sense. And when I stress that, you'll remember I said it's not just one signifier, it's the very ability. It's not just one signifier that's missing, but you could say it's, it's the whole range of different associated signifiers through which an anchoring signifier through which one could even begin to respond to certain dilemmas of existence, of identity, and so on and so forth. But one of the crucial ideas, I think, with foreclosure, and it has that, that resonance with the, with the legal term foreclosure, which I think for many of us has this kind of horrifying, oh, they're foreclosing my house or whatever, that you will be like fundamentally, uh, something will be extracted or you will be lost, um, something will be taken away from you in a kind of legally binding way. One of the interesting implications then is that you could say, and here I'm going to quote Van Hurler, that by using the concept of foreclosure, Lacan refers to the fundamental problem of ownership in psychosis. This, I think, is crucial. Whereas, if one has installed the symbolic order within a given subject, that introduces the individual to the social order and, via identification, makes them a co-owner of its conventions. That potential relationship, that potential ownership, that, that sense of being a member within the symbolic order is lacking in psychosis. Russell Grigg also takes up this point. He elaborates it in a slightly different way. And he says you could say that once foreclosure or because of foreclosure, the lack of being rooted in the symbolic realm, that the psychotic subject is always a kind of outlaw in terms of being outside, outside of the symbolic. Of course, outlaw has got some kind of problematic uh, connotations, which maybe we don't want to follow up. But I think this idea, to stress here, the problem of ownership and the idea that not to be rooted, adequately rooted or grounded or anchored within the symbolic order means that one not only lacks a sense of ownership, but that one lacks a kind of uh, identification with the conventions, the norms of uh, a given location. Van Hurler goes along to say, in psychosis, the confrontation with others can produce confusion. Close interpersonal demands provoke perplexity to the extent that little sense can be made of another's intentions. He insists, one uh, consequence of foreclosure is a fundamental difficulty in making sense of the other's intentions. Continuing, foreclosure leaves the subject with the feeling of being an outsider and with a fundamental sense of not belonging. Just to anchor that point, to have, it's not just, you could say, a psychological sensibility that I don't belong. It's more, it's, it's, you could say it's a non-belongingness at almost an ontological level. So it's not just a kind of affective feeling that maybe I'm not part of this group. It, it seems to be something far more fundamental. He continues... A further consequence of foreclosure is that the question of personal identity, who am I, remains unanswered. Foreclosure leaves black holes at the level of a person's identity. He continues, foreclosure undermines the very experience of identity. Making one further comment, uh, in psychosis, elements from the unconscious are not experienced as coming from within, this is a point we made earlier, but as strange messages that come from without. Okay, so let's then just try and make one point about desire. Uh, Van Hurler does describe it, but we've skirted around it a little bit. You could say that if one is not adequately anchored in the symbolic order, if one's not anchored in the symbolic order, then the big other of the symbolic order is also not properly operating. 
And if the big other of the symbolic order is not operating, it becomes very difficult to locate oneself, as we've seen within social customs, social norms, social understandings, conventionalized forms of social knowledge. And indeed, you could extrapolate conventionalized instances of what is consensual social reality. So there, there are some challenges on that front. But adopting a Lacanian perspective also means that there's a problem with what Lacanians would call phallic meaning. I can't begin to tell you how many times this has confused me and thrown me into a, a, a miasma of frustration and uh, uh, upsetness. What the hell is phallic signification, phallic meaning? This is, I think, what is being said, and this is how it links back to what we're talking about. You could say that to be a neurotic subject, to be anchored in the symbolic order, to be able to, as it were, have some phantasmatic fantasy dialogue with the big other, means that you've got a kind of radar of desire. You've got an ability to be able to make guesses at, postulates about what other people seem to think is important, what they desire, what might be important about me, what might be desirable about others. The Lacanian idea is if foreclosure has occurred, if you're not grounded in the symbolic order, that process doesn't work so well. If you don't have a firm grounding in conventional social norms, social values, it becomes quite difficult to make any grounded uh, hypothesis about the desire of others. And the idea then would be that other people in their desires become difficult to read. Other people become enigmatic. And you could say your own sense of desires and how to situate yourself relative to other people is also something that is difficult to understand. Why do Lacanians term this phallic signification or phallic, the idea of phallic meaning? Here we need to read phallic, not as having anything to do with that, a phallus as such. Uh, it's certainly in the, you know, the, the tired uh, baggage of how phallus is often used in a kind of Freudian phallic symbol. Phallus here just means signifier of desire. So to sum that up and try and put it in more straightforward terms, you could say, this is what the theory says, that foreclosure means that there's lots of little black holes at the level of subjectivity. And one way that that occurs is that one's uh, desire radar doesn't work so well. Different other types of theories have theories of other minds. They talk about autism as an, uh, a difficulty, a fundamental challenge on being able to think, to see it from someone else's perspective, so on and so forth. Here, the idea is rather that what the big other desires, what other people desire is opaque to me, and I'm not sure how to position myself relative to that. And of course, you'll get a sense here that desire for Lacanians, for Lacanian theory, is a very important way of locating oneself. Desire is a way of being, and postulates about other people's desires, is a way of giving social meaning and, and getting a sense of what is valued in this situation. If that doesn't function, then identity is not going to be securely anchored and other people in their prospective desires could be seen as quite menacing, as difficult to understand. Now, I think that gives us one perspective on thinking about paranoia. In paranoia, it's very difficult to get a sense of what's going on. Maybe there's a kind of persecutory sense of things that are happening to me from outside that I'm not able to understand. But what paranoia and a paranoid delusion will give me is a kind of plot, a kind of narrative that will give, even if it's a quite a frightening narrative sense to what's going on and how I might be threatened, it gives me a kind of plot. It gives me a kind of script through which to understand the desires of what's happening around me. A further point about desire is if one's desire radar is fundamentally disabled, let's put it like that, <clears throat> other people, as I've suggested, can start to be a little bit opaque and a bit inscrutable. And I don't know if you've ever had this situation. Maybe you can find someone, a colleague once did this to me, not on purpose, I won't name him, um, who had like a good therapy face. And I, I was telling him some arbitrary thing I'd done, feeling me being neurotically guilty all the time, vaguely guilty of whatever it was. Um, and he just did the, uh, and it was slightly uh, paranoia inducing. What is my point? My point is that if you're, as I'm calling it, not a very Lacanian term, uh, if your desire radar doesn't work, other people can seem inscrutable. And you could say then that the best way of trying to try to make sense of them is 
maybe it's not the best way, but the default mode of trying to make sense of that is a kind of paranoid disposition. We already visited this point when we spoke about the mirror stage. Lacan's notion that paranoia isn't necessarily um, an external added on quality or psychical disposition, but it's actually inherent to the ego. And that idea that there's something in the world that's because my ego comes from the outside in, things that are happening to other people that are happening in the world have some pertinence to me is an important one. And I've certainly had the clinical experience of working with um, at least two or three people who would fit into, you could say, the general parameters of something like psychosis, for whom the question of what other people are thinking about me, or the question of what some woman whom I'm seeing, who maybe I kind of feel a bit attracted to, their desire is, is, is problematic. It's not easily domesticated. It's not easily given a kind of neurotic, uh, conventionalized guess as to what it may be, rather it seems to be fraught with dangers. It seems to be very easily given a kind of paranoid narrative. In other words, to try and make the point, one of the implications of not having this desire radar, as I'm calling it, is that paranoia kind of takes its place and that uh, paranoid delusions might be seen as functioning in exactly that way as operating when it's difficult to make those postulates about the desire of others. Let's see what other points we need to emphasize from uh, Van Hola. This is the one I've just tried to deal with, the difficulty in applying, in grappling with what makes one desirable to others and the desire of others. The other point that he makes very nicely is to say that you have little black holes where one's identity would B, because there is black holes, there, there's gaps. Remember the tissue analogy that Leclerc gave us? There's gaps, there's an inability to respond to questions, existential questions of what is my identity? Who am I? What do other people want of me? And Van Hurler also very nicely wants to suggest that those gaps also, he's of course borrowing from Lacan, that those gaps of an existential meaning will occur presumably at the basis of sexuality, with questions of meaning of life and death, with questions of an intergenerational heritage. Those areas, those key existential questions of subjectivity are ones which don't just give us a minimal degree of conflict or, or, or uh, we have to find them and we're looking and we're searching for them. You know, the kind of soap opera theme of I'm always trying to find who my real father is or whatever. Rather, they're met with uh, a degree of perplexity, with an inability to properly respond to them. Great, so what we can then do, just by conclusion, is we've given a nice overview of a series of possible consequences of foreclosure. And in so doing, I suppose what I'm a little bit aware of is that it feels that we're thinking of psychosis as a deficit. We're thinking of psychosis as a lack. We need to, by the way, also still respond to the question of the foreclosure of what. We'll do that very briefly. And I'll return to that question. Initially, as we saw the example, uh, I, I read the example in the Wolfman case of this, this horrible experience the Wolfman has of thinking he's cut his finger off. Freud wants to think about this and, and Lacan takes it up to a certain extent that maybe this hallucinated experience is a way of telling us that there's been a foreclosure of castration. Well, we can do certain types of things with that, but that's not going to be enough for Lacan. He, he, he thinks that foreclosure is there. He thinks that Wolverfung uh, is the term that's in Freud that points to this radical exclusion that he wants to use as the overarching structural device of psychosis. But it's not castration or not only castration that's foreclosed. What is foreclosed? Well, for Lacan, what's foreclosed is something more significant than that. It's Lacan in the 50s, so it's going to be something to do with a signifier, but not just a given signifier. It's going to be something to do with paternity. And when he's talking about paternity, it's not just, I think, because he is, you could say, the product of a patriarchal realm and all the rest of it. I think he's grappling with not just paternity, but with how one is located in a symbolic order and a kinship order. Presumably, one's family name and one's family constellation is part of that. So there's something to do with paternity, but ultimately his answer is going to be, 
What we see in psychosis is the foreclosure of something specific, the foreclosure of what he would call the name of the father. And let's just say at this point, we will continue this in the subsequent lecture, the name of the father is not just a name, it's not just a signifier, you could say what's foreclosed is an operation. It's not just the name of the father, but it's the naming function which would allow me to locate myself within the symbolic order and to be thoroughly, have it thoroughly installed within. So we will start to talk a little bit more about the name of the father to, to in, in the lectures that follow. I just wanted to answer the question, what it is it that's foreclosed? But then I also just wanted to come back to that, that issue. Are we not finding ourselves stuck here in a deficit model, an implicitly devaluing model of psychosis when we say psychosis is the lack, it's, it's an inability, it's, uh, it's the, the failure of the installation of the name of the father. It seems hard to escape those various different implications. And indeed, maybe one can't. Maybe one should just admit that the theory is applying a deficit model here when thinking about psychosis. Colleagues, and Stein van Hulle is one of them, will say that later Lacan definitively moves away from that. Again, it's a question. It would be interesting to discuss and think about that by looking more closely at Lacan's later work. But here's the last formulation I would like to leave you with. If we've said that in foreclosure, the subject does not have easy access to, doesn't have intuitive, installed, as it were, uh, natural access to an installed set of conventions, social understandings, norms, so on and so forth. That means, in a sense, they've got to make their own way. They can't just rely on standard explanations. And one of the most interesting features of the John Nash biography is that from school all the way through his education, whenever he tried to do mathematics, and of course he excelled in the field of mathematics, any number of teachers and colleagues from Princeton days to earlier, when he was at uh, Carnegie Tech in Pittsburgh, yeah, in Pittsburgh, um, all of these people would say, they would remark, he never followed the rules. He, he would always find a way, even in fairly junior levels of school, of proving a maths problem in his own way. In other words, what am I saying? I'm saying that Nash, you could say, was psychotically structured prior to the triggering of his psychosis. And you could say that the additional labor that he took on or had to take on was not simply imbibing, swallowing whole the symbolic order as it was given to him, as you could say, being a little bit dramatic for a while, everyday neurotics do. He had to find a way of making his own formulations, his own explanations, his own ways of accounting for the world and using a symbolic frame in a novel way. In other words, to draw to a conclusion, couldn't we say then that psychotic structure was the very underpinnings of his originality, of his genius as a mathematician? I think we can say that. And if we can say that, then it might well be the case that we needn't only think about psychosis in terms of a deficit model.